Now, our panel of heavy hitters will be um, talking about the Canada Infrastructure Pipeline and possible role of the bank in incentivizing that build-out. I'd now like to introduce um, Elan Dunsky from Denton's, who is sponsoring this session. Elan, if you'd like to come up to the podium, it's over to you. Come in the back door, huh? That's good. <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, Denton's is pleased to be sponsoring this afternoon's session on Canada's new infrastructure frontier. This general session will focus on the role the Canada Infrastructure Bank could play in establishing a prosperous and solid foundation for Canada's new infrastructure frontier. It will highlight the need to leverage private investment to support the public infrastructure agenda, to target projects that wouldn't otherwise come to market, and above all, to get it right as the bank gets off the ground. Our moderator this afternoon is Glenn Campbell. Uh, Glenn was recently appointed as Assistant Deputy Minister of the Canada Infrastructure Bank Transition Office at Infra Infrastructure Canada. Previously, he was Director of Financial Institutions at Finance Canada. He was also Senior Finance Official for APEC for three years, focusing on Canada's economic relationship in Asia, including promoting infrastructure development and investment. Glenn was Finance Councillor in New York during the global financial crisis covering Canada's interests on Wall Street. He has spent 25 years, sorry, he has 25 years of experience in the federal government, including at Global Affairs, Industry Canada, and the Treasury Board Secretariat. Please join me in welcoming Glenn Campbell and the panel. Thank you, are we on? That's great. Um, first off, I'd like to um, thank Dylan and for sponsoring uh, this event, and of course, um, greetings to my uh, Minister Soe, and uh, a really, um, um, for me, inspiring speech to hear uh, our chair um, speak before you and talk about the vision. It's becoming very real to the many of us who've really worked on uh, this project over the last uh, 10 months or about a year ago since the government had announced uh, this ambitious uh, project. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to moderate this panel with a number of experts and many of whom uh, we've relied upon um, as we were consulting uh, widely uh, over the past uh, 10 months and be really welcoming their unique perspectives uh, today and uh, helping to identify many of the challenges and opportunities that um, lie ahead. I did want to take, however, a couple of minutes uh, just to echo and, and add to a few things that uh, Janice had mentioned about the progress that the government has made. Um, myself leading the transition office, um, really working hard to uh, eventually deliver an independent arm's length institution and then develop a relationship not just with the Government of Canada and, and the responsible minister, but all of you in, in many ways, and, and particularly Janice's um, focus on many of our governments to be the real clients of the bank and everyone else are kind of counterparties kind of sets that that framework i did want to echo the the progress that we've made um, since last year we have moved forward before parliament um, that took many months and it was very uh, public and you know, my minister spent a lot of time uh, you know going through the democratic process but now we have an incorporated um, crown, crown corporation the um, balance sheet of $35 billion has now been appropriated by Parliament to be delivered over time. We have an initial corporate plan approved by Treasury Board and Ministers that allowed us to move forward and support Janus in setting up the, the institution. We've moved forward on a lot of institutional uh, aspects of this exercise, much of it internal and a lot of it external. Much of the external um, work being done between uh, Infrastructure Canada and my colleagues at Finance Canada, which has involved consulting with many of you in this room and, and others around the world, international organizations and countries, uh, not just to those potential investors, but those who have tried innovative models to address this common issue of having an infrastructure gap um, and a willingness to bring in more uh, private sector efficiency and also given the um, capital that's available, particularly risk-bearing capital, to come in and really missing two things. One are, you know, bankable projects and the other is a mechanism uh, to help manage some of that risk transfer 
Um, and so that more infrastructure can get built for Canadians, and that means experimenting also with funding models. So with the idea of consultation um, in the spirit of this panel, um, let me just go and introduce, and so I'll end and turn it over to some provocative questions to my colleagues. Um, let me first begin by uh, introductions, albeit brief. Many of their detailed um, esteemed bona fides are included on the app and in various documentation. Uh, to my right here, Nick Hahn, Senior Managing Director, uh, Macquarie, and also a director of the C2P3. And so congratulations again to you uh, on another successful um, <coughs> event, along with Mark and his team. And he's based in Vancouver, and a long list of transactions supporting public policy outcomes in Canada. Um, next is Jane Bird, um, Senior Business Advisor with Bennett Jones, also based in Vancouver, and a long list herself of great accomplishments, including just this week another accolade for the Canada line on the side to which she was so integral in that success. Um, David Moore joins us from across the pond, partners in, at, at Denton's uh, in London, where he's a lot of experience in the various P3 models, as they're various called in the UK and I think in Europe. Uh, Jordan Azinga, a partner in infrastructure advisory at Deloitte, based in Toronto, and full transparency. Um, you know, Deloitte has been uh, helping the transition office and setting up the Canada Infrastructure Bank. And I know um, Jordan will say nice things, but I can say he's also been a challenging force in my ear ah. to make sure we get this right. So they've certainly played, played that role uh, appropriately, as have many people in this room. And finally, uh, Eric uh, Bellman, partner of U.S. Infrastructure at uh, QIC, Queensland Investment Corporation in Australia, um, whom, by the way, the minister and I were, were, were pleased to be received and meet them when we were in Sydney a few months ago, um, which has been very um, rewarding talking to various investors around the world. So with that, <clears throat> let me start and ask a question to the panelists. I'll ask some general questions targeted at a few of my colleagues, and then, of course, others feel free to intervene uh, as you see fit. Let me start with Jane. Um, following on Janice's um, overall framework of what the vision is for the Canada Infrastructure Bank, perhaps you might want to offer up you know, some of your views on what you think are the challenges and opportunities of moving to this new form of model, given all the experience that you've had, and uh, some general perspectives. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. It's um, an honor to be with my colleagues this afternoon. I, maybe there's sort of two parts to that answer. One goes to some of the remarks that we've heard already around the need for the bank generally, and then, and then I'll just offer some high-level thoughts about um, risk transfer and, and leave it to my colleagues to provide some excellent examples <clears throat> internationally. In, ter in terms of the need for the bank and, and, and staying at a high level, I think, I think the first point is that given the experience um, in this room and, and the experience that we've talked about on this anniversary over the last couple of days, I think it's important and I think it's impressive that the Canadian government has said that we now need uh, to invest in an opportunity to take the experience that we've gained over the last 25 years and turn our attention to a more sophisticated way of structuring some of these transactions to expand the spe spectrum of opportunity for the private sector to public with the, partner with the public sector. I think we have a really strong bit of groundwork that's already been undertaken. And it's incumbent upon us now, with the support of the Canadian government, not just sort of spiritually but financially, um, to make the next investment in really um, reaching a more sophisticated level of, of um, financial structure. Uh, secondly, I, I think it's an opportunity to bring Canadians' money home to Canada, frankly. Um, I think that uh, if we're smart about this, we'll be able to see some of the Canadian investors and Canadian pensioners uh, see their money being invested in um, ever more creative uh, projects in Canada. And I think, I think that's an opportunity that's there for the taking. And I'm, I think the bank would be well positioned to assist in that. And then, and then finally, I think that notwithstanding our success, there is a, a gap still um, between the expertise, as I said, that's, that's in this room and the experience in the public sector um, with respect to some of the more complex financial transactions and structurings. And I think that there's, the bank has a role to play in, uh, in bridging that gap and in, and in creating, as the chair said, 
um, a bridge between the expertise and capacity that lies here and will lie at the bank and assisting um, with all levels of government as they, as they look at some of the more uh, compli complicated financial structures. And I would just conclude that part and then I'll speak just a second on the revenue transfer point. But um, I would just also say that, again, as was, uh, as was um, part of the earlier comments, it's just one arrow in the quiver. This doesn't replace um, all of the infrastructure investment that all levels of government, um, the commitments that they have made. It's just another tool um, to uh, up our game, if I could put it that way. And I think we need to remember that we're not replacing you know, the good work that's been done and will, will be ongoing, but we're just really looking at an opportunity to become ever more sophisticated. And then on the, your point, uh, Glenn, about, about revenue transfer, I think, I think at a high level, as we, as we think about revenue sources and risk transfer in a more sophisticated way, it just broadens the spectrum of opportunities. I mean, that's, that's all we're talking about. We're talking about being smarter and cleverer to create opportunities to transfer a little bit more risk to get more projects in the ground. I mean, it's, it's not particularly for me uh, anything more magical than that, but I think there's a lot of power in that. And then, and then I'll just conclude by saying, I think it provides a discipline, because we all sort of stand around and say that you know, infrastructure is valuable and we know that, um, but I think it, it provides a kind of rigor and discipline around really identifying that value, where it lies, for whom it is valuable, and figuring out where the revenue source is, and trying to tap that revenue source in a more creative way. So I don't mean to be provocative, but I think it's basically saying, let's not be lazy and let these projects you know, stay on the, on the balance sheet or with the taxpayer when we can be smarter and more uh, creative about identifying for whom that value was created and trying to create a separate revenue source. Thank you, Jane. And you really drive home a point, and I know it was echoed by uh, my minister, uh, Minister Soli, that this is one tool in the toolkit, and the various PPP models are tools in the toolkit. Traditional financing uh, are, is a tool in the toolkit, and even in some cases, privatized, they're all tools in the, in the toolkit to be used uh, with the, in the appropriate cases. This just allows our partners to a new tool where it makes sense to do um, user pricing or revenue models. With that new tool in mind, perhaps I can turn to Eric, um, our American representing some you know, Australian investors, as when you look up and you have a new office in, in New York, when you're looking at North American opportunities in Canada, um, what are some of the benchmarks and criteria that you would look at um, in, in the context of the infrastructure bank and projects coming forward that would make them attractive um, for your fund to consider uh, come in and competing for that mandate uh, in Canada? Sure, and thank you for having me here, by the way. This is fantastic, and it's been a very informative couple of days for me, so I really appreciate for all the folks that I've met. Um, look, we, uh, we're very keen on PPPs. Uh, institutionally, we have quite a track record of doing these, these type of deals in Australia, obviously. Uh, we all are aware of the challenges that, that come in, in getting this, the deal flow in this space uh, for us across North America, certainly the U.S. as well. Uh, we're we're long-term buy and hold investors, um, which is something that um, really we feel aligns us well with these type of uh, of assets uh, as they as they come via PPP or other uh, privatization and partnerships. Um, that I think in in the current world that we're in puts us in a place as as again long-term holders uh, in a place where uh, long-term partnership not only with the concessionaire, but with uh, other partners in the financial structure, where I think the CIB can play a, quite a, a compelling role, uh, is, is important. Uh, you have to be able to build in the sort of flexibility and trust in the long-term ownership structure in, in, in these investments, because in the type of time horizons that we're investing in, things will change, and things are changing, as we all know, at an increasing rate uh, over time due to technology and, and uh, you know, social changes and all the things that we've heard about over these couple of days. So that type of uh, structure and partnership and long-term thinking, uh, the ability to build that flexibility in with your, with your capital partners uh, is, is critical um, because you really can't, on the type of, again, on the time horizons we're looking to invest, you, you cannot uh, just bank on the static upfront uh, deal docs and terms um, being relevant in, in 15 or 20 years. And so you really have to look at it as a, a, a comprehensive partnership 
inclusive of uh, the, your capital partners. Um, and to, to echo what Jane said, uh, act as a little bit of a bridge to have that trust to the government itself or to the concessionaire, um, which we're, we're quite constructive that the CIB may be able to play that role as well. That's great. Thank you very much, Eric. And um, keeping in the international theme, um, before we come back and, and, and narrow the focus a bit more to Canada, maybe I can turn to Dave and then Nick, particularly to um, share some views on your experience, starting with Dave, um, from your UK or European experience, where there is a lot of history around revenue models and patronage or user pricing that we can build on. And maybe you can share a few views um, you know, on that question. And then perhaps Nick, we're looking at, um, I know you're based in Canada, but on the US and perhaps Australia. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be here too. Um, we, we've had a variety of um, projects where revenue risk has been transferred to the private sector, and, the, and they've, they've come in various shapes and sizes, and they've been varying degrees of success. And so I've, I've picked on um, four of them here. First of all, there's High Speed One is the line from London to the Channel Tunnel. So if anyone's been from London to Paris, you will have been on High Speed One. That's the first bit in England. And that was let as a PPP project by the UK government um, in the late 1990s. And a consortium, which I represented, called London and Continental Railways, won it. And they, and they did so on the basis of certain revenue forecasts. Now, at about the same time, um, we saw a huge growth in low-cost low, low um, air travel. So at the time when the bid was put in, it was anticipated people would be going from London to Paris and back and that there'd be a, a lot of traffic doing that. At, at about the same time, people could go from Edinburgh to Madrid or Bristol to Rome. You could go all over the place and do it really quite cheaply. So that meant that there was less interest in going from London to Paris because, frankly, the market had just expanded. So the project had, had to be saved and had to be restructured. And it was saved and restructured. And, and now revenue risk in that project manifests itself in two ways. There's a, the, the, the principal train operator is called Eurostar, and that takes revenue risk. That runs trains to and fro between London, Paris, and various other destinations, and it takes the revenue risk. Um, but that is not a project-financed vehicle. Um, it gains access to the track by, tra by paying track access charges to High Speed 1, so to a more limited extent, High Speed One is also taking some revenue risk because, of course, if Eurostar didn't run the trains, then High Speed One would not um, generate any other income. Now, the banks have got themselves comfortable with that um, through various means, but one, I think, which is important is the fact that the access charges are regulated. So there is a five-yearly process of setting the charges, which will apply for the next five years, and they, and they are payable by the train operators, and this is more than just Eurostar. But those charges are payable by the various train operators, and they should be sufficient for High Speed One to meet its costs. And uh, there's also a process for having an interim review. So if there's, if there's an event, and there's a defined list of events which could lead to an interim review, the, the regulator can step in and reset the charges. And this is, gives the banks and others considerable comfort that the finance will be in place in order to keep HS1 going. Now that of course is all fine, but having a regulator, um, if, if you don't already have a regulator, then you need to establish a regulator, and so you probably need to do that by legislation. You probably then need to establish the, the independent regulator outside government. So all that takes time and is, uh, and, and is not a, a small undertaking, but that's, um, that's one possibility. Another project I worked on um, was the Tyne Tunnel project, which is a road tunnel in the northeast of England, um, near Newcastle, if you know it. And uh, hitherto, there was a, a, um, a, a dual carriageway road which went into a single carriageway tolled tunnel. And it was one of the, was, I think, is the fourth worst traffic spot in the UK. So the idea was using a PPP mechanism to put in a second tunnel, which would also be tolled. Um, next to the existing tunnel and make, effectively make the whole thing dual carriageway. So that was done. Revenue risk was transferred. In fact, no, no income was required from the government at all, so, or any, any public sector income at all. It relies entirely on, um, on the revenue. 
Now, the advantage there, of course, is there's already a lot of traffic, so people know that the traffic is there. It's not a greenfield project, and they know there's excess demand. Putting the new tunnel in place, of course, would put the tolls up because the new tunnel has to be paid for, so that will suppress demand to an extent. But um, there's a lot of confidence um, that the traffic would be, would, be there, would be there. Also, the payment mechanism was quite clever in that each month the revenue comes in, and if you think of the revenue coming into a bucket, the bottom slice, as in the first slice, goes to pay the authorities' costs. It has fairly modest costs, but they need to be satisfied nevertheless. The next slice, all of that goes to the private sector, and everyone had, had reasonable confidence that that would be en enough to finance the scheme. So that, so that was another, obviously, big positive factor for this project. Thereafter, the revenue was split in, in, in varying proportions between the authority and the public sector. So although revenue risk was transferred, it was done in a way that the banks in particular were confident that there would be sufficient revenue in order to fund the scheme. Um, the third scheme I mentioned briefly is the M6 toll, which is um, next to the, um, uh, the M6, which is a road which goes um, north out of London towards Scotland. And there's a particularly congested bit near Birmingham. So the M6 toll was developed, which is effectively to provide relief around the north, north of Birmingham. And a 53-year concession was let, um, a three-year construction period, 50-year concession. The concessionaire had freedom to set the tolls. And um, so they had lo lots of autonomy. But the revenue forecasting was not as it should have been. And I think actually the, the traffic has been about two-thirds of what has been anticipated. So that's a project which has struggled to some extent. And then the final um, issue I'm going to mention is rail franchising. We have, in the UK, we have trains operated by the private sector under um, franchises. And in all bar one cases, the revenue risk is transferred to the private sector. And, um, of course, there are some organizations that actually crave revenue risk because it's revenue risk which they, that they see is something they're good at managing and the way they can make, make money. So they, of course, if they're going to do that, they need the tools to manage that revenue risk. So although some fares are regulated, I set with, within parameters set by the government, other fares are unregulated so they can manage the um, revenue that way. And there have been various approaches to sharing the revenue risk, um, which I won't go into. And there's also been debate about whether it's fair to put the risk of general economic downturn onto the, the private sector. So if you have a franchise last for, say, seven years, and that happens to coincide with a recession, there's not very much you can do to manage that. But that's been an ongoing debate for many years in the UK. Hey, go on. I just want to pick up on the point that David made. So these type of highly structured strategic models, you call them or whatever, um, where you can parse out and tranche things from the operating model, revenue risk, even breaking it down into volume risk versus price risk and so forth, in, in unregulated structures is something that we, we sort of is, is relatively common and done a lot in private sector energy deals, for example, which is my background, but in others as well, healthcare. And what I've found over the last couple of years uh, is that they're not necessarily as well understood or often used in the infrastructure space, which, and there's no, there's no good reason for that. Um, so, so why not, you know, bring this type of uh, innovation and sort of private sector expertise and capability uh, to infrastructure deals? Uh, the challenge then is, well, how do you get the banks comfortable? And if it's a, if it's a sort of a one-off deal that doesn't have eight more just like it behind it, the banks may not really want to do the, do the, you know, go, go to that effort, right, to, uh, to finance one deal. And, and again, that's potentially a role uh, where a CIB could, could play a, a very constructive role in sort of bridging those, those type of gaps. No, I agree, and I think going back to the language that um, Janice, the chair, used, so a project that is near viability that just needs that, that final link to manage those concerns on both sides, I think is a highly value-added value um, role. Perhaps I can turn to Nick and uh, follow up on the same question with David. Well, David's been very detailed, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be very high-level in, in contrast. And I should say that I'm British and Australian and Canadian, so hopefully that excuses what I'm going to say in advance. Um, 
I'm going to use a sort of family analogy. So the, the Canadian PPP market and infrastructure market is in many ways the beautiful offspring of the UK and the Australian P3 markets. And like, like any good, beautiful child, it looked closely at its parents and learned a lot from them. The, the British parent was, um, you know, a, a very uh, strict disciplinarian, uh, you know, or directed child, uh, parent. Uh, it was a, a very much a government directed program, you know, highly structured, highly detailed, um, and tended to look after the private sector pretty well in general when things went wrong. The Australian parents, I'm not going to put gender, uh, you know, stereotypes on them, but the Australian parent, you know, a little bit more of a wild child. The Australian infrastructure market had grown up, you know, more from the private sector. A lot of the deals were revenue risk from the outset. A lot of the deals were actually initiated by the private sector as, as uh, you know, in many cases, unsolicited proposals. It was less government directed and, and a lot of revenue risk. Bit of a gambler, the Australian parents, um, you know, at times, and some huge successes in revenue risk deals, but also some, you know, some pretty, uh, pretty dramatic failures. So anyway, here we are, you know, the Canadian uh, PPP child has, has grown up. It's now Mark Romoff, 25 years old. Um, there's an aunt coming into the picture, Janice, who is, <laughs> who is both going to continue the discipline, but is also going to broaden the horizons. It's time for the Canadian P3 and infrastructure child to grow up a little bit because, let's face it, you know, it's, it's a very dutiful and, and obliging child and it's, it's, you know, studied hard and done its homework and it's done some great things in its, in its life so far. It's had some great projects, but it's a little bit boring and it hasn't really expanded its horizons fully. So the, the point, and, and, and it also has, by the way, a bunch of very wild cousins just south of the border in the US <laughs> <laughs> that it's got to uh, you know, go on family holidays with every now and again and get influenced by. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> the reason for that analogy is that I think the infrastructure bank, uh, it, Janice used some, some very important words that, that I certainly picked up on. In, in my career, um, there have been a lot of really good deals that I've worked really hard on that haven't worked for perhaps two reasons. One reason is that some of the risks, there was a timing problem where, and it generally was a timing problem, where the private sector couldn't take that risk right then and there, but with the passage of time and, and successful projects, it could. And then secondly, quite often, there was a counterparty problem. And Janice used the word that the bank will be a, a counterparty for private sector investors. There's a problem. You know, you need somebody who's sophisticated to deal with. You need somebody who's credit worthy to deal with. And that's going to be particularly important in bundling uh, opportunities to improve Canadian infrastructure, particularly for indigenous communities, where, frankly, there's a need for, for a great aunt. Sorry, Janice. Um, <laughs> but a need for a great aunt to, to provide both that vision, but also the discipline and the structure. So that's my, that's my family analogy of... Uh, of the role that the Canadian Infrastructure Bank can play. It's a very exciting role. What we've got to not lose sight of is the fact that the, you know, the Canadian P3 and infrastructure market has, has been an extremely good child and it's grown up extremely well and it's getting a lot right. And it's a matter of now expanding its horizons as it goes out to do you know, newer and greater things in the world. Um, Nick Hahn, if I had a mic, I'd drop it and I'd say, <laughs> you know, we're done uh, today. But uh, thank you for that. And speaking of some of our Wild West cousins and some of those down south and American friends, I'm now talking to about Jordan. And uh, not to joke about those folks on the other end of our panel, um, but I was going to ask Jordan to get a little bit more um, specific about some of these deals and some of those that you've been a part of or Deloitte's been a part of, particularly in the U.S. and maybe Mexico and, and Chile, and draw some of those high-level examples about um, making real what some of those project structures may, may look like to bring the private sector in in a way that they're taking on that kind of revenue risk and some of the challenges and opportunities that, that may exist. Sure. So, so why don't I focus on the, the doom and gloom for two seconds, because I'm really bullish uh, on what, what Glenn is doing and what, what Janice is doing. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because Glenn writes my, uh, my invoice, uh, or I write the invoice, you write the check. Um, but uh, I think the, the thing that we have to keep in mind 
is that there's been some great examples in the United States that have been very successful, where we've seen revenue passed on uh, to the private sector, and there's been a couple where they haven't worked. And I don't bring that up to be uh, dark about this, but I bring this up because it's very informative to the infrastructure bank uh, that we're all trying to build. So principally, if you look at the last five years, and I think, Nick, you'd know a fair bit about this as well, uh, there's been a number of toll roads that have gone into distribution. <coughs> I'm talking uh, Pocahontas Parkway, SH-130, Indiana Toll Road, and to a lesser extent, Northwest Parkway. And all of those had their own eccentricities that caused them to go into distress. I feel like you want to chime in, but I, 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 all of those had their own eccentricities that wanted, uh, that, that caused this to happen. But one thing is true of all of them is they got their forecast markedly wrong. And you mentioned this uh, about what you've seen in the UK. In two of those instances, the Pocahontas Parkway and an SH-130, we had a government lender into those projects, the TIFIA office under the US Department of Transportation. I don't bring that up to, to uh, impugn the reputation of TIFIA, but it's actually relatively important because following that distress, TIFIA ended up selling their position to Poca in Pocahontas Parkway to a private investor who then sold it again to another investor, presumably at a fairly handsome profit. In an SH-130, it's public knowledge that that agency is now a unwitting equity owner in that business. So why do I bring that up? I bring that up because it's relatively informative to the kind of bank that we need to build. So we have the benefit of hindsight in building this thing. We've seen things not work uh, south of the border with our wild cowboy cousins. And uh, with that in mind, I think there's a, a really important capability that the bank needs to have, which is it needs to be able to internally diligence its traffic and revenue forecasts and the economics of that. It also needs to have the capability, when things don't go well, to be able to restructure, to amend, extend, renegotiate its positions, and potentially sell. Now, to talk about the Chile and, and Mexico markets. So uh, there's going to be a lot of conversation, obviously, about risk and what's the appropriate risk to balance. And I see, as someone who advises investors principally, uh, that a significant risk to maintain the credibility of the bank is a risk of not having outsized returns to the private sector. And that's going to sound weird that I'm saying that, but I think it's essential that we talk about it. And what we don't want to have happen is the bank come in, invest in a project through concessionary capital, and then all of a sudden we have something where an investor gets an outsized return. And there's some simple ways that we've seen in Latin America uh, to deal with this, and I'm sure that this has happened uh, down under as well. So the first uh, and most common way is through a cap and collar structure. In uh, Chile and Mexico, they basically said, look, we will guarantee a floor to your revenue, and in exchange, we will offer you, we, we would demand from you a revenue sharing arrangement in which if you get a certain return threshold hit, we're going to get paid, and we're going to all benefit. And that's something that I think is very positive because you've created a project that has some degree of speculation in its revenue stream. And in exchange for that, for putting the floor uh, in place that sort of stabilizes that floor, allows it to be bankable, you get to participate and to ensure that there's no public sector or public optic uh, issue surrounding uh, the procurement of a, a greenfield project with some degree of concessionary capital. So I think there's a lot of good examples that can make this uh, bank a success. I think we have the benefit of coming at this with a number of examples that have been successful and not successful in other markets. And I'm quite bullish on what Glenn and Janice are, are doing. Nick, you wanted to? Maybe, maybe if I could just respond. I mean, I think a, a lot of the points, you know, Jordan, you make uh, are very valid. But I think, I think what the bank has to be very careful not to be is it, it has to be very careful not to be a helicopter parent. It has to be very careful not to try and de-risk projects, but really to try and fill gaps in the right. risk profile that are preventing a project being done. And, and I fear sometimes we're, you know, we're, we're moving towards the, let's try and de-risk the project for the private sector. The, the fact is that I, I take a robust view. I, I believe that PPPs and, uh, you know, infrastructure, private sector infrastructure, involvement in infrastructure is really about risk transfer. And some of them are going to go wrong. They have to go wrong if there's adequate risk transfer. Mm -hmm. And the private sector needs to be robust about that. And the one good thing about the private sector is that you learn from your mistakes very quickly. If you, if you make a mistake once, you, know, you, you get slapped around a little bit, but if you make a mistake twice, you get fired. So we do, we do learn from our mistakes and we evolve and we improve very quickly. 
And, and the, the infrastructure bank should not mollycoddle that. What it should do is identify the gaps in the risk because the private sector, frankly, um, you know, there was a period after the GFC where private sector investors wobbled a little bit. Mm -hmm. as, as Jordan says, you know, lots of toll roads, uh, particularly in the US, struggled. But you know, we're, we're back. We'll, the private sector will take mm -hmm. uh, a lot of revenue risk. And let me, let me use one example again from the Australian parent of my, uh, my, my analogous uh, child. Um, the Australian government, Macquarie, had made a lot of money out of a series of Australian toll roads. And the Australian government in New South Wales really wavered and they said, well, maybe we should do this as a government project. Maybe we should take the traffic risk because the private sector is doing so well. And they wavered and then they thought, no, we've got a good model. Let's stick with it. That road was the Cross City Tunnel, which was the first Australian toll road to dramatically underperform. It was 35% of its original revenue forecasts. And, and Macquarie was a bidder and we owned the two toll roads either side of it and we thought it was gonna work. It just, I think that example more than anything goes to illustrate that you can never fully predict risk. You have to manage it. You have to uh, allow the private sector the opportunity to manage it. And frankly, you have to allow us to learn from our mistakes when we make them. Because just like bringing up a child, you can never prevent the child <laughs> making mistakes. You've just got to make sure the mistakes aren't too severe right. and serious. Nick, would you, uh, a question for you, would you think that because of the shape of our debt capital markets relative to the US, where you have underwriters basically being paid just to sell because they get paid on a per bond basis, they sell private activity bonds, um, and they don't really bear that spread risk like you have up here where you have underwriters basically saying, I'll buy it this, I'll sell it this. Do you think that makes this market more resilient uh, and less uh, susceptible to buying into really aggressive traffic and revenue forecasts relative to the United States? No, I, I, I don't actually think, uh, I don't think that's very significant. I think, uh, I think the fundamental difference here is that, you know, for many years there's been a, a bit of a timidity on the part of the uh, public sector agencies to push revenue risk deals. And that's in part, it's, it's similar to the Australian story in some ways. The uh, Highway 407 here in Ontario is, is probably by any measure the world's most successful toll road. But for want of a better word, there's, you know, there's a bit of uh, envy in government. You know, did, we, did we sell the risk to the private sector too cheaply because it's done so well? And I think it's the success in, in Canada that has almost you know, restricted the volume of deals. But I think you make a very good point on the, on the bond markets generally, and, and that goes to your point about, you know, being able to step in and restructure. The, the fundamental thing that I think scares any uh, equity investor in P3s and should scare anybody is that when they go wrong, the bond market, unlike the bank market, isn't actually there to, to restructure. The bond market is very binary in its reaction, the banks could certainly play a very big role yeah. there. And, yeah. and so I, think, I, th I think that's it. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go. I think there's, there's another point on that whole question of, of risk transfer. You mentioned Canada Line. I think it's sort of perhaps not well known that we were successful in transferring some revenue risk in that deal. I, I think it sort of is a secret of Canada Line. It was a very... Uh, very closely guarded secret. It was, <laughs> indeed. Um, but I think the point is, first of all, it's not absolute. This was a, a percentage, if I recall, it's a long time ago now, 10% or thereabouts of the revenue risk. So first of all, it's not an absolute. And, and, and when you make the point, there are lots of ways to structure these that mm -hmm. aren't sort of 100 or zero. And, and the other um, point I just wanted to, to raise as well around understanding risk, particularly on, on some of the more complex projects, um, I think the bank has a role in, in understanding and and becoming sophisticated in its due diligence um, around understanding what, what the risk is. And if it is at the same time bridging to a level of government, it could take um, risk, say, in a transit project, which is not just a question of, you know, if it's a recession, people don't get on the train, mm -hmm. but it's a question of who's operating the buses as a, as a competitor, who's controlling road construction to create a parallel highway, who's... Um, mm -hmm marketing the entire transit project and how much profile does that particular investment get in the marketing plan. So I think as we, as, a, as the CIB starts to 
play the role of really understanding the risks that we're talking about and unpacking them. I think they can get creative around um, mitigating some of that risk transfer in a, sub in a subtle way. Good. Eric, do you want to jump in before I move on? Uh, I was just going to follow on. <clears throat> Excuse me, on Jordan's point, I, I, do, I, I think you do see examples of that, and we have in the U.S. where uh, on the simpler type of PPPs or perceived simple, uh, where either either the markets, the debt markets in particular, uh, inclusive of the government-sponsored financing, uh, just perceive too little risk and you end up with a significant amount of debt in, in, and too much debt really in some of those projects with a really thin sliver of equity, right. if any. Um, and in some cases, it's really just the, uh, the EPC or the developer figuring, well, I'll take the work. Uh, there's a very recent example of that in Indiana, right, with a, uh, another, another toll road that's gone, that's gone sideways. Unfortunately, that project itself is front and center with the current administration because that's where our vice president is from. Uh, which is, is painting the space in a negative, in a negative light. So I, I, I think you do see that dynamic, and to the extent that projects in general are uh, typically a little less uh, levered, and, and in particular going forward in the more complex type of structured deals that may warrant the inclusion of the CIB uh, may not suffer mm -hmm. as much from that, from that dynamic, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we covered one of the questions I was going to ask about what do we need to do to mitigate some of those risks and, and challenges. And, and just picking up on, the, on that point, um, Eric, and going back to part of Janice's speech where she talked about the role of and the value added of the Canada Infrastructure Bank is not just in structuring projects and delivering federal support. And I like Nick and, and Jane, it's not de-risking, it's managing the risk transfer and for an appropriate return of those players and to ensure the bank's informed as a, as a value-added agent, as an objective agent, to ensure the risk is assigned to those most able to manage it, not just absorb it. And having um, a, a government type of entity in there in the public interest that's working independently will have a value-added role. And then it also links to its center of expertise role. Over time, these are complex projects. We've learned a lot from other countries. Building the capacity uh, across Canada, uh, in the bank, to, to use the center of excellence to know what has been done before. And this really is about an innovative financing tool. And that means we're going to experiment. Uh, as as the, I think the ministers often said and others, this is an innovative tool. The bank will have some tools at its disposal when the management gets in place. And they're going to work through counterparties to figure out what best combination of the tool of debt and equity it can be used for any of those particular projects. So the government's not prescribing how that would play. It's really, here's tools, go out in a transparent way and hopefully get to better outcomes and get infrastructure built that otherwise wouldn't or those infrastructure that can open up other capacity. Um, while we still have some time, I believe just a, the one last uh, question or maybe a couple. Uh, relates to, maybe I'll start with uh, Jane and get others in, as to what constitutes revenue. And we talked about it earlier, and there's, there's, we, we heard this really fantastic presentation from Mr. Dr. Roth about value capture and land capture. And my, I was going, well, lots of ideas. And, and I wondered, I, I'd just like to get everyone's perspective on being creative of what revenue, what may constitute revenue. Maybe Jane, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, as I was saying at the outset, I think part of our challenge is to really un understand what value is and, and to whom. And I think um, maybe I'll, I'll take that question and bridge it to, to another just sure. sort of observation. Um, I think one of the, the advantages of having this be a federal initiative is that we can not only cross provincial boundaries, which sometimes in Canada we're a little bit challenged about, um, but also intermodal boundaries. So mm. I'm thinking about a value capture just to to throw it out there, not being a railway operator, but I'm thinking about our supply chain and, and David Emerson's old comment that we're a small, narrow trading uh, economy, highly dependent on our supply chain. And the physical um, imperfections, if I could put it that way, in that supply chain add up in totality to a lot of value. So I can see a situation in which, for example, um, there would, would be some sort of a partnership between one of the major railways, for example, uh, the city of Vancouver, Port Metro Vancouver, in creating a series of improvements along that supply chain. And one of the things I've observed with great envy about the railways is they have a very, very uh, precise way of measuring how um, their track usage and their uh, asset usage, and they know if they're getting a 0.001% advantage 
and they know exactly what that translates into. And I think if we were to bundle a series, for example, of supply chain improvements, and we were able to quantify the value of those improvements to each participant along that supply chain, whether it be you know, an overpass or a track improvement or a double tracking in which you know, a number of agencies could contribute to those improvements, I think we could, I think that's an example of a kind of perhaps multi-jurisdictional and perhaps intermodal series of projects where you could really identify a value and a revenue source that we might not have otherwise tapped. Re revenue is a value that can be monetized and all too often, for lack of a, a counterparty often, we don't actually capture the full value of infrastructure investments. So Jane alluded to it, I mean, land value capture associated with transit improvements is one of the most obvious uh, values created, but very few people actually monetize it because it's created over a longer period of time than our financing tools allow. Hmm. So I, I worked a lot in Hong Kong and the railways there, is, as everybody probably knows, they're kind of property companies that, that build railway lines. The same is true in Japan. And about 40% of the cost of building the railways is actually funded by land value capture. But what is not often known is that that, land, that value capture doesn't come from the current line because we don't have the commercial financing tools to upfront it. That value capture funds the second line or the third line and, and so on. And we miss those opportunities. We miss them in Canada, we miss them in the US. And that's, it's an obvious lack of a counterparty. And, you know, just as one of many examples, that's something the Canadian Infrastructure Bank could do. And this, this land value capture, I think, comes in two ways, doesn't it? There's, there's the sort of ob obvious thing of building a building above a station. So there's a brand new station, you, you put a building above it, and there's, there's, there's new real estate. But there's also, um, and that's, I would have thought, reasonably straightforward, the more challenging um, um, aspects is if you build a new metro extension and therefore the house values around or flat values or business values go up is there a way of capturing that and that's been tried in various jurisdictions i think particularly in america actually um it's been um maybe in the states it's been successful but in other jurisdictions i don't think it's been terribly successful people have talked about it a lot of course it's very unpopular saying to someone your your, your house has gone up 15 percent can i have 15 percent please um, but that's, that, that's an alternative way, which maybe through rates or business rates or something like that, you could try and capture some value from infrastructure development. Jordan, Eric. Um. So I, I, I'm selfishly looking at those audience questions and I'm uh, ready to go to answer either one or three, but uh, I, I'm happy so to answer. answer. I don't think I have a lot to add in terms of what constitutes revenue and I'm sure the audience would love for me to pass on that question. Um, but I, I'd love to dive into something selfishly in the same way Jane uh, did what any good politician does and answers the question that somebody wishes they were asked. Um, I'd like to talk about how this bank could, from the outside looking in, work with procurement agencies because I talk to a lot of people and they're always asking me how they could work. Uh, from the outside looking in, speaking just from my perspective, I've had no real uh, sense that the infrastructure bank is a procurement agency. And I think it's, it's relatively important that people understand that uh, there's a significant role here for these procurement agencies to allow for revenue risk projects to go forward. Uh, the contract documents are pretty well established uh, for these uh, agencies to, to work. And I think uh, there has also been a nomenclature issue, which is that there is some difference uh, with respect to what we're talking about up here in terms of the type of project we're trying to propose. Uh, in terms of how these projects are funded, but there still are in many respects alternative financial procurement, and that's sort of a made-up phrase as well. And so I think if we just take a step back and we figure out like what exactly is being changed here, it's not a monumental uh, game changer. What we're talking about is doing something that allows for a step change in the level of infrastructure development in the country, building better infrastructure that improves the quality of lives, but I think everybody wins, and that includes the procurement agencies. But that's just me looking at this from the outside in. I'm not speaking on behalf of Glenn, obviously. <laughs> but uh, I've selfishly answered the question We've I wanted seen. to answer. I have so. to tilt my chair around to, to <laughs> ask a few of those questions. So there's a general answer to that question that's put forward. 
is the vision of the government of Canada is the Canada Infrastructure Bank is a project structuring entity really upstream and then once a project is structured the decisions around how that's procured is really one for that project consortium and we've talked to uh, many of our provincial counterparts to say if a project comes from that jurisdiction right. then we would collaborate with those who really are procurement agencies uh, on how best to procure that entity and we, we really see uh, another form of partnership of working with that particular uh, government and look at here in Ontario how um, great our relationships been and continues to be uh, with Infrastructure Ontario. Um, Aaron Corey and I have talked about this, you know, collaboration, uh, you know, at, at, at many times and Amanda Farrell this week and Partners at BC. There's a lot of opportunity to collaborate to both strengthen the existing P3 market and also to, to move beyond in, a, in another uh, toolkit that's mutually reinforcing. Um, I'll just talk, there's a couple of questions here about will CIB invest in availability-based PPP projects. I think very clear in the legislation that went through Parliament um, was uh, investment in revenue-generating uh, infrastructure projects in the public interest. I think there's some creativity down of what constitutes the support that may come from a provincial, municipal, or federal government. The question is, is that uh, an infrastructure that has a business model and some form of revenue, and down the stream we would expect governments being investors, governments potentially making contributions to a particular asset that could be in the form of, of direct capital or perhaps even an availability-based payment. The, the, the clear differentiating criteria, is there a revenue model attached to that infrastructure such that the government can show or the bank will show the government that you've crowded in new investment that otherwise wouldn't have been there or a project that otherwise would not have gotten done. I, I would say that as part of the center of expertise that there is clearly going to need for versatility there to help um, project sponsors when they come forward that the bank's not in the position of just pitching one model, it's what's the best tool for that particular asset. And I think that's going to be a really clear message to get out, is that even for the consultant community that's here, is to help guide and nurture the market where jurisdictions are really putting forward the right model with the right piece of infrastructure. That's a long question. I'm hard, hard to read on some of those. Um, while, I'm, while I'm reading that, why don't I um, ask for some free advice to my panelists, and that is, um, from your point of view, what does success look like that pertains to the Canada Infrastructure Bank, and what advice can you give me and Janice and the minister and others in the, in the short term of what do we need to do to, to build the foundations for success as we move forward on this endeavor? Sure. I'll, Maybe I can start with Eric. I'll start, so no one takes my answer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, look, to me, uh, a short or medium term success for the CIB would be if, if you have uh, folks like, like us, uh, Nick and others, you know, bringing projects to you, right? That, that because we understand the role you're trying to play, we understand the kind of parameters that you'll invest under, uh, and we've identified the right sort of gap in the projects that we're working on uh, that could be solved potentially by uh, the addition of uh, CIB presence, uh, potentially some financing, you know, well, some financing, perhaps some governance role, uh, role in, in actually transacting. It, to me, that, that would be success because that means that the market sort of understands what, what you're trying to do and, and what the funds, the purpose of the funds mm -hmm. uh, is. Um, so where you don't have to go, you know, shopping around trying to insert yourself into projects, but rather have done a good enough job explaining to the market and, and perhaps by virtue of some of the deals that you've done by then, uh, demonstrated <laughs> the, the role that you'll play. So I, I think at that point when things are coming to you, that, that would be a good marker of success to me. Right. Jordan? So I would say, <clears throat> I would say I think success, uh, the knee-jerk action is to say you're building more stuff than what you organically would have done using taxpayer-funded dollars only or using the, the traditional method. But I think that that's probably uh, a little short-sighted and myopic. I think the, the, the real metric I would want to see would be things pertaining to the actual uh, end in mind. So infrastructure is a means to an end, and I think the real end is improved mobility, for example, for people, particularly people from low-income communities, perhaps trying to get to places of work, uh, reduce carbon footprint, a more resilient infrastructure, uh, mitigated traffic congestion, stuff of that nature. So that's sort of uh, a bit a uh, high level, but if I were to then say in 10 years, how do we know the bank's been successful? In a very sort of um, touchy-feely way, I would say 
have investors who are not here today and infrastructure participants who are not here today, have they opened up offices in Calgary, Vancouver, and Toronto? Uh, have we got some of the guys that are, that are very successful in London and, and in uh, Sydney, are they coming here and saying this is a place to work? That would be a really good uh, barometer for success for me uh, in terms of whether this bank has actually created a credible market uh, that's uh, using this new alternative delivery model uh, and payment mechanism. Uh, and whether everybody takes it seriously. Thanks. David, briefly. Um, I think it's important for the bank to be clear about what it's going to do and what it's not going to do. And we've strayed into all sorts of areas here, and the bank, for example, could get involved in evaluation. Maybe it should, but I'd suggest it probably shouldn't get involved in that. That's the procuring authority's role. So there are various things, and I, I think the, um, the, the bank just needs to be clear about what, what, what it is going to do and what it's not going to do. I mean, the, the, the slightly glib answer, but I think it's worth saying that anyway, is that I think the, the bank's role is to, is to ensure that the public sector funds go further. I accept your point, Nick, about not de-risking projects, but presumably the bank's function is to address a certain part of the risk in a project so that the... The fund, so that funders feel more comfortable putting the money in and also so that the public sector element is reduced and therefore you get a, a, a bigger bang for your buck. So I would have thought that's actually the fundamental role of the, of the bank. James? Perhaps saying the same thing, but, I, but maybe a little differently. I think the, the challenge for the bank, as a colleague of mine observed, is not to be seen simply as a cheerleader for infrastructure. And I thought, um, this is a colleague who's, who's with um, a very significant pension fund here. And he, he said that the worry is that it will just be a cheerleader for infrastructure. And that leads me to um, agree with Eric's point, which is to say, I think, in another way, if there are deals that are done and infrastructure that is built because somebody's said, this is, a, if not a game changer, a material change, that is providing an opportunity for me to have more deals executed and more infrastructure in the ground, then the bank will be seen as not merely a cheer cheerleader for infrastructure, but truly an instrument through which we can build more stuff. Okay. Nick, final Looks comments? Like you get the last word on this. this is oh, I really don't like it, Nick, when you have the last word. It's the least I may desirable grab that. outcome. We'll go. Yeah, so as a, as a private sector investor, success to me is that the bank is, and this may be old-fashioned, but the bank is like the, the old-fashioned business banker who you can actually talk to and work with to shape your business opportunity. It's not the bank that I go in and fill a computer-generated credit score and you know the computer tells me whether I've, I've made the loan or not. And just to use an example from south of the border, you know, TIFIA, for example, increasingly is 100% of debt in private projects. I don't get to meet my banker until I've won the project. That's Great not point. good. I want to meet my banker, Glenn Janice, I want to meet my banker when I'm actually bidding and structuring the project, not, not when I've already won and taken the risk. As a Canadian taxpayer, I, I think the key goes to this discussion we've had. The success of the bank will be if it's encouraged the private sector to take more risk in building infrastructure, whether the private sector loses money or makes money and manages the process to make sure that when the private sector does lose money, it doesn't affect the delivery of the mm -hmm. infrastructure. That's great. Thank you very much. And if my... Um if I could just add a few words, and perhaps because the public servant that I am, of thinking about this has been a robust conversation about showing that the CIB is a tool to an end, and these are about structures to attract investment to get infrastructure built, but they're means to an end of public good. And for my benchmark, it's when municipalities and provinces and other federal ministries come forward and they have confidence in this new model, and we can demonstrate that actual projects are being built that otherwise wouldn't have been, or they're freeing up scarce resources and there's a, there's a confidence that that model works. And at the end of the day, this is why the government's putting a lot of capital behind this innovative instrument. And just to, uh, you know, remind, this is 10% of an overall $187 billion plan over 12 years. There's a lot of intersecting policy here to provide a longer-term framework to better manage public investment in infrastructure. A lot of that going from coast to coast to coast, from small communities to, 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 to large ones, to rural and remote, 
that not every tool or program is going to meet every ill. And I think I just encourage everyone to see how this fits into that broader framework that not just the federal government, but many of our partner governments have, have laid out and that this tool fits nicely in that mix. And uh, with that, I would like to thank my panelists for offering their views and, and their perspectives to you. And with that, uh, thank you very much. And Clued, and turn it over to Mark. Hope, sorry, just a few minutes past time. Not bad at all. So my measure of success is that uh, lots of things were talked about today, which I believe actually hadn't been thought of before because I was watching Janet and facial expressions and just making, hmm, hadn't thought about that. And that's good, right, because it also means that there's a lot of scope to still architect this, this uh, new facility to really make a difference. And the key, we all know the key, we're all waiting, of course, for the announcement around the board and the CEO. That'll come soon enough. But once that happens, I think there is real opportunity for excitement. And I'd love to have us come back and discuss the bank a year from now and see uh, exactly where we're at. And I suspect we'll all be very impressed with that. So what I'd like to uh, do is, first of all, thank again our panelists. So please join me in thanking the panelists.